five. There we are. We're live. Hello. All right. Everybody. Everybody. We are here. Yep. We're all going to check our phones now. Good, good evening, LinkedIn. Hello. If you just joined us, come say hi in the comments. Let us know where you are. Mm -hmm. Where you are in the world. We're just a few minutes as usual. Let everyone come in. Let's come in and say hello. Got a notification there. Um, here's maybe a fun one is just if this isn't your first time and you've been with us before, see if you can guess, see that curtain behind Rachel, see if you can guess how close that is, because we actually talked quite a bit about this and I was really surprised. <laughs> also surprised the yeah. distance. So if you've got a guess how far that, that curtain is behind Rachel, not the height of it, but how far distance wise the space between her back and that curtain is, please let yeah. us know. Please do. Hey, it's like being a circus. <laughs> hey, Heather. Hey, Heather. Hey, Heather. You, you can give us the first guess, Heather. How far is Rachel's curtain behind her? <laughs> and are we looking for centimeters or Keenan? You're American. I know you like inches. Feet. Yeah. Feet. Feet. <laughs> we'll make it even more fun. <laughs> No you're so glad you joined us, Stephanie. Anything. You're so glad you've joined us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although, do, do they win anything? Oh, well. I guess, right? maybe, maybe we could give them your curtain, Rachel. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yes. You have to sign it. Mm -hmm. you, you, curtain. So, I'm for gonna, anyone I'm just checking gonna... us, how far away is Rachel's curtain to win a signed version of Rachel's curtain by her? Yeah. I mean, that's a prize worth something, isn't it? That is worth that is worth lots. That's priceless. That is worth loads. Yeah. No one else will have one, so um <laughs> other thing, four feet. Four feet. Do we have any advances on four feet? Anyone else? Andrew, Simon, Sam, hello everyone. Joanna, hello. thanks for joining us. How many inches <laughs> or centimeters <laughs> or feet away is Rachel's curtain? Because we we just had a revelation before we came on air here. We just we didn't realise the distance. Four They're feet. either really big or really small. Those those flowers. Joanna's <laughs> twenty feet. <laughs> twenty three feet or four, four centimeters. I mean, my gosh, this is quality which, content, ladies. Which one is it, you Joanna? Don't get this anywhere else, do you? This is quality content. Hey, Caroline, ten feet, <laughs> Andrew, whatever, right? Feet, Andrew, yeah. Wow. I mean, Steph, do you want to have a guess? Did you actually get? You I did see it. Not. You saw it. I, but no, I can't say what I would guess before I saw it because then that would give it away. Um, <laughs> so my lips are sealed. Lips is high stakes. But it's very different from what I originally thought, and um, it means that the scale of the pattern is is much different yeah. than what I thought as well. Yeah. It's like have you ever I mean, seen um, a Ted episode where it's like those cows are far away and those ones are really small. Have you ever seen that episode? No. No. This, this, this is, you, need, you need to look up that Father Ted episode. This is kind oh, of what so this these, these pattern is about. They're either huge or they're very, very far away. Love it. I mean, Sam's making a good point here about it depends on how big my feet are. I'm assuming you're referring to my feet, Sam. I'm a beautiful <laughs> size five and a half. So I don't know Hello, if that's Nick, giving it away. Aaron. No, oh, Aaron's having a wee sleep, right? We better get on. Yeah, right, exactly. let's get started. We've said we're sending people to sleep. <laughs> Rachel, your curtain is now sending people to sleep. Who knew that? Right. Who you knew better get started because I'm looking at the script and, and you've got the first bit to go. I do have the first bit to go, but just I'm going to keep everybody in suspense, so we're going to do the curtains last. I mean, this is quality <laughs> content. This is something else. Well, thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure to see you. And there's some familiar names coming up, so it's great that you've joined us again. And if you have joined us again, let us know what, um, what um, session you came to before and let us kind of understand where your wee journey's going because it's nice to have more of a connection with people. So I am Rachel Brown, for those of you who don't know me and for those of you who can't see the beautiful title on the bottom. And I'm part of Creative Entrepreneurs Club, which is a network member driven um, for the creative industries. We've got 1800 members at the moment. Um, and actually part of this series was to try and give you a bit of inspiration and some quality content. 
<laughs> which we are not failing you on, I can assure you of that. And tonight we're going to have a brilliant interview with Stephanie Boyle, somebody who is really a treasure, um, I think, and I've not heard anyone say anything negative about Stephanie ever, 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 ever. Amen. And the quality of her work is incredible. So I'm going to pass you over to Andrew, who's going to give you a bit more of an introduction, and then we're going to get cracking. Excellent. Thanks, Rachel. And welcome, Steph. Um, okay. So, yeah, thanks for all those who are joining us. Um, so I'm Andrew. For those who don't know, I'm the founder of Made Brave. We are a strategic brand agency. We're based out of Glasgow. Um, as Rachel mentioned, we've been joining forces over the last um, few months. Um, and you sort of during this sort of um, you know, in light of COVID and everything that happened, I suppose we joined forces, made Brave and Creative Entrepreneurs Club um, to try and offer a bit of support back to the creative industries at the moment. So uh, Rachel and her team at the Creative Entrepreneurs Club UK um, have very kindly gifted um, their platform for free. It's usually a member-based service um, and offered it up to help support people right now. Um, so if you're looking for a little bit of support, there's a job board on there where we've got all sorts of job vacancies. So if you are looking for a job, go and have a wee hunt on there. Or if you have one that you're looking to fill, please pop it up on there as well. There's also all sorts of one-to-one -one support that you can uh, tap into there. So if you're needing uh, a little bit of guidance, a little bit of help to what your next move is at the moment, you can get um, some advice from likes of Keenan, likes of Rachel, myself, and there's a whole host of lovely other people on the site. Um, and as Rach mentioned, um, we, we created this series to, to hopefully bring a little bit of positivity, a little bit of um, happiness and inspiration during um, what's obviously been a challenging time for people in, in all different ways um, and, and different um, different times. Um, last session, we sat down with Jolene Crawford and Mel Strisovic, um, who are creatives, fashion <laughs> entrepreneurs. We spoke to them about all things creative and their journey, and they're soon to launch um, pajama suit brand irregular irregular sleep pattern okay. so if you want to see that episode and didn't catch it the last time you can jump on over to the creative entrepreneurs club they have them up there we have them on the made brave youtube channel and you can also catch them on linkedin but today we have as we mentioned none other than stephanie boyle so um you know having a strategy behind content and the content that you create for your brand is hugely important and you know recently at made brave we've been talking a lot about content and some of the biggest trends there's a recent blog that Keenan and the team worked on in the recent um, webinar where some of our uh, team from our content teams and marketing teams talked a lot about these trends. Um, but, you know, content is very, very important and it's important to have a strategy behind to understand, you know, what you're doing and where you're trying to head. And Stephanie is a huge expert in this because she as well, um, uh, Stephanie works for herself as a content writer. Um, and I can't recommend Stephanie um, uh, enough. Stephanie worked at Made Brave for a number of years um, and a few years ago went off on a journey to start as a freelance content writer. So Steph, thank you so much for coming thank and joining you. us. To get us started, right? Um, I know your journey, but everyone in here doesn't. So let's, you know, would you mind letting us know a little bit about how you got into the world of content and where your journey began? Oh God, it started really long, really long ago. Um, I started writing and had my first article published when I was 13. And I was one of these really lucky people who knew from that age what I wanted to do. So without going into my whole CV, I um, wrote for magazines for a really long time, whenever I was a teenager and in my early 20s. And then I started working in social through a vintage shop that I worked in, which was really fun. And then I joined in other, in other agencies and small brands. And then I joined Made Brave whenever I was 22. And um, after that, I was there for three years. And then I went freelance, as we figured out just before this, to, about two years ago. Three years ago yeah. <laughs> about two years ago now. And I can't believe how fast, it's, how fast it's gone in, which is crazy. But yeah, just I've been constantly writing for as long as I can remember. And then the strategy and social side of things um, and content side of things all came I guess is an amalgamation of that and a natural sort of career path whenever I realised that it maybe wasn't quite sustainable to just want to be working in magazines my whole life. Um, but it's good to have both. So yeah, that's how it all started. Fantastic. This is the bit where me and Rachel never know who's going next. I know. Well, I was going to ask you. <laughs> I was going to ask a question, that awkward pause. I was going to ask a question, Stephanie, because the, the, the people that join us on these calls have got such a varied background, and I'm not sure everybody will know what a content writer is. Mm. So what what do you do? What, what, what does it entail? 
I mean, I guess it's just um, any any form of content, whether it's someone's social content or blogs, which is probably my speciality, more so with that journalism background, um, newsletters, website content, even ebooks and everything as well. Just if there's any anything content related, I guess it's it's a mix of entertainment as much as it is about informing people. So it's that type of that type of writing essentially that comes comes into play. And yeah, is there I, a magic formula to that? Is there something that you know is a special hook that gets people in, or is it, do you develop your own style? No, I mean I guess each brand has their own tone of voice, um, which is something we'll go into later. Um, each brand has their own tone of voice, and it's about adapting that as much as possible. It's almost like acting. You basically have to act and become a character and adapt your knowledge and everything and, your, and the strategy that you create for people into their tone of voice to create something that feels like that brand and is relevant to their audience as well. So no magic formula, just strategy and brand and practice. Yeah, so, so I often think that's something really difficult about your role, Steph, is that you have to be like chameleon, like you very much, you're probably working on someone's you know, brand, as you say, and it's mm -hmm. one very different tone of voice to, you know, next minute, an hour later, you're on something else. I mean, <laughs> have you got any tips for if there's any writers just now or any content um, strategists that are thinking about that and they have to do that? What, you know, what, what have you learned over the years that you think helps with that? Oh, take a break, take a break in between it and try and try and um, split up your day a little. It's really hard. It's really hard for managing social specifically because, I mean, people expect a response within a really short amount of time. And then you're maybe chopping between brand personalities like every couple of minutes <laughs> and it can be really draining. It's almost like being a translator, the way that translators have to take breaks as well. Um, mm. it's, it can be very mentally exhausting. Um, but I'd say take a break and also just, I guess, think think about the brand as characters and think about acting as well and thinking about, you know, picturing that character and not just a set of adjectives to describe a tone of voice because it helps you sort of put yourself in that character's shoes so that you can respond as them. But yeah, try and take some breaks in between it because you'll go mad. <laughs> and... Yeah, I suppose um, in terms of like um, you know, uh, you know, everyone's life's kind of been turned up a little beside, a little bit upside down you know, of recent terms. And some some people's jobs have been easier to do. Some people's jobs have been harder to do. Some people have been left without jobs. Um, I'm just interested to know kind of how COVID and kind of the, the change of things has has impacted you. Have you found more work, less work? Is it much the same? Or um, and and is there any things that you're doing differently that you think that you you know post COVID, if we can ever ever get there, that uh, you know you, you'll keep in terms of creative processes and and such like? Oh, I mean, there was one week when my partner's also freelance, and like every couple of days there's a phone call, and we were like, okay, another one bites the dust. That's another client call, <laughs> um, which was understandable because a lot of businesses didn't know what was happening. But over time, as people started getting used to lockdown and adapting, then a lot of clients came back and a lot of new clients came on as well. Um, but in terms of processes and everything, I've just I've been trying out some different routines to try and keep my productivity mm. um, a bit higher. Um, because I think during lockdown, I was in such a state of shock, as most people were, and trying to be productive, especially writing long form content and be focused writing that long form content was really hard for a while. So mm -hmm. I started trying to create some new routines. And I saw one on Twitter of all places to find a way to try a new routine. <laughs> but I saw one on Twitter that said that you wake up at six and you work solidly from seven to 12 and then no emails or anything because you do all your emails and your meetings after 12 and then well 12 to 5 and then you do whatever you want five onwards and it has actually really helped to just having that little bit of focus especially when writing longer form content it's good to just like get your head stuck into mm -hmm. it and stay focused and get it done because I found that I was like finding it really, really hard to focus during that time because I guess it was really stressful and everyone was going, I think a lot of people were going through that. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll just try a routine that I've not tried before and it's, it's worked. I've really enjoyed it. I can't say I get up at six every single morning, but I try and do it for most for most of the time. At least it's once a week, at least once, at least, at least once. once. I mean, this whole new routine <laughs> once a week. But no, um, it's, it's easier just now because it's light. But yeah. I can't promise that will be the case whenever it's pitch black until like half eight in the morning. <laughs> so I don't know. So yeah, that's that's maybe something I'll probably continue. Um, just because it's been really nice to get my head into things and also just like tick off my to-do list by lunchtime. And then I can do all the nice 
chatty stuff and nice emails and stuff later on. So yeah, it seems to be working for me so far. I like it. Excellent. And you mentioned there, Steph, that you've got new clients. Is the is the request different? So post COVID, was it fairly? Um, routine the kind of requests that you got in but now are we I get the impression it's not this is not my area of of specialism at all but I get the impression that people are just desperate for good content but they're not quite sure what that is mm -hmm. and that there's a change of pace and that because our circumstances are changing we can't meet each other live we're having to have different ways of engaging content is key for brands at the moment yeah. so have people's requests been different or interesting or exciting I mean, yeah, like I think a lot of the work I was doing before was just like month to month content, especially blogs um, and people. We had like a plan put in place um, of the content that we would publish kind of in the next few in the next few months. And then um, that obviously got completely blown to smithereens because things completely changed and people didn't want to, of course, appear tone deaf putting out things whenever the world had changed so much. So we almost had to start again. Um, and I think people have been a lot more reactive with their content, which has been really interesting. And things have been more about commenting on all these changes that are happening. Um, and I guess it's been um, it's been a case of, of keeping that sensitive. And for brands as well, brands are wanting to create content around their values and they're wanting to show who they are as a brand. And that's been really cool because it's been it's been cool to help brands figure out who that who that is or what their values are and then creating some content to get that across as well has been really interesting but I find as well there's a lot of during these times there's a lot of people wanting to start ideas that they've never been able to start before because they've been so busy mm. um, so I've been working with quite a lot of startup brands who it's just fresh new ideas and they're wanting to start something completely new um, and now that they've got the chance to do it they're like okay let's go so that's been really fun I've enjoyed that. So, so I suppose, I suppose on that, Steph, you know, there's there's been so many people that you know have perhaps lost their job or they, they they need to change completely, right? And they've been thrown online, and you know they're they're on LinkedIn. They're thinking, how do I how do I find work? How do I make my find my voice in the world? How do I you know how do I start to create content? And I, I know this is what you're great at, and you know building some structure around that because it's very hard, isn't it? You go online, you think I know I should be saying something, but what do I say? And I suppose when you know, when we've worked with brands and I've worked with you in the past, you know, what you're very good at is kind of building and breaking down that structure into a few kind of content themes. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you've got any kind of advice for, you know, anyone listening just now who thinks, you know, I need to be doing more. I need to be, you know, but how do I do that? And how do I figure out what those content themes are? You know, um, you, you touched on values there and maybe we can kind of talk a little bit about that and how that kind of ties into content themes. Um, but I'd love to hear your, your viewpoint on it. I mean, I think at this time especially, and if you are just starting out, don't feel like you have to have all like this big mind map of themes and lots of different um, sub themes and subcategories as well. I would say maybe treat things more like a campaign and start with one and start mm. with one thing that you want to talk about. And I mean, this this can go for like blog content or videos or whatever, but start with with one theme and then think of all the like sub themes that would come off that. And then also think about how you can reuse content as well. So like if you create a hero piece of content, like a video or a blog, how can you break that down into smaller pieces of content? And then all of a sudden you've got this, you've got this campaign, but don't, mm. don't try and think of it as too much. Even, even for seasoned brands just now, because no one knows what's going to happen. Like this idea of creating this big strategy or like content themes or content ideas feels a little obsolete. We all, we kind of all have to treat everything like a campaign a shorter mm. campaign just now and I'd say maybe something that's like even start with something that's maybe a month long yeah. um, and then you know go from there and use the results from that to figure out what people like and what people maybe aren't responding to and then use that as the next stepping stone to create your next campaign and your next campaign and then as you get the practice in and you start to see these patterns form with what people respond to then you can go on and create something that's that's bigger and a bit more permanent. Yeah, and I think I, th I think that's a great point. Is that, that I think that you know there's so much happening in the world, and and you know we're now everything is amplified, and you almost feel that like you have to have a say in everything. And I think when you look or when I look at people who are successful with creating great can content and great strategies, they don't talk about everything. They pick mm -hmm. some subjects that are, you know, I suppose true to them, things that they know, you know. So for example, you know, it, it makes sense if all of us had a strategy, we're all talking about either brand or content or mm -hmm. creativity, right? Because it's what we know, it's what we understand. And I, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, a, a great point is like, don't try and 
overtake the whole world. It's kind of break it down and just start with one thing. So I love yeah. that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, for sure. And how do you get inspiration for that then, Steph? Where does it come from? Oh, I mean, I think I've spent my whole life like either flicking through magazines or looking at my phone, <laughs> looking <laughs> at my phone and just like constantly looking for beautiful things or cool ideas or, or good copy. And I think it's that. It's just a, a, a continuous state of studying. Um, and it, the thing is, it doesn't it doesn't always come from like brand magazines or from anything that's specifically related to advertising or content. It can be from like some clothes I see, like I might see a cool pattern in something that will spur on like maybe a, vis a kind of visual style for someone's content. Or I might see a cool idea from, I don't know, like an, inf an influencer as well and then work it back towards brands as well. It's just, I think, constantly looking if you if you deliberately look for inspiration for a certain project, I find that it never actually comes. But I think if you just kind of always keep your eye out for cool things and save them, save them somewhere, then you'll be surprised by how much that will spur something on. Um, talking to people obviously is a really great one as well. Although when you're freelancing in lockdown, I mean, Ace and I only really have each other <laughs> to talk to about these things just now. But you find that. Um, a lot of ideas just come from collaborating with people and having putting those two brains together and coming up with something completely new. So I guess, yeah, just constantly looking at stuff is you probably get shouted at for always looking at your phone. But if it if it's in the name of research, then I think it's all right. So, yeah. yeah. And for the, for the last two years then, Steph, you've been you've gone freelance and you've gone out in that journey. Um, you know, I suppose what were the what were the biggest challenges that you found in terms of becoming a freelancer, having to provide for yourself and kind of having to, you know, find work and all that kind of stuff, all those challenges, what, what's what been the biggest one for you? I'm not an admin person. I think every, a lot of freelancers, creative freelancers tell you that. I just don't, I don't like having to do all the, the finance side of things and admin side of things. Um, and that can, that can be a challenge to, because it's essential, it's essential and you have to do it. And it can be a challenge to not procrastinate around it and just get it done and make sure that you're that you're safe and you're okay um so that's been a big challenge and i guess just the times whenever um whenever maybe a, a big project will stop or a retainer client will kind of come to an end because they've hired someone that can be really scary um truthfully <laughs> and you'll know you'll know um that can be a really scary time because you start questioning of course you put money aside but you're it's not as it's not as um, consistent as knowing that you've got a wage coming in every month. Um, and especially with everything that happened at, at earlier this year, um, that was a really scary time as well. Um, and yeah, other challenges are just like, I guess maybe fighting, fighting the guilt that comes with taking some time off. Um, yeah. That can be really tricky. That can be a big challenge as well. Um, and yeah, especially just now, if, if you're not sure about where the economy is going to go, you're like, oh, I need to do the work while it's here. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to take any time off because I need to do it and save. Um, that can be quite quite hard as well. Also, I guess just general things like I'd, I'd like to buy a flat and I guess being self-employed or being a couple that's self-employed is going to be more of a challenge mm -hmm. as well. So it does it does affect things um, for sure. There's There's definitely some challenges to it, but it's great. It's a totally great thing um, to do and it's um, it's great fun and it's great having the flexibility of it, um, of freelance as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely challenging, but it's really enjoyable to all of it. Okay. And do you look after yourself then, Steph, you know, well-being and mental health, it's been such, we've talked a lot, a, a lot about it uh -huh. over the last few months with pretty much everybody that's been on and sharing their stories with us because it's, it was such a shock to the system what's happened, but mm -hmm. actually what you've described, that constant um, challenge is always there. It's always been there for freelancers. It was exaggerated um, in, in lockdown. Um, but have you been looking after yourself? Have you been doing any health and wellbeing tips? Yeah, I mean, I think it's for a while, I think I was in, in, den <laughs> in denial with everything. And I was like, everything's fine. It's fine. Like that meme of the dog sitting there with the fire around them. Like that was, that was how I felt. <laughs> that was how I felt. And I think that it actually took, it took, you know, a, a time for me to actually sit and accept everything that happened and feel my feelings <laughs> and just kind of accept yeah. it. And then I was able to make a bit more of a plan. But I mean, it's things like I love, I love to cook. That's basically 
my hobby and my go-to and my comfort mm. and um i think just things generally things like meal planning and um like cooking something nice every day and just doing that has been really nice and just making sure that i'm staying hydrated <laughs> has been a big one and sleeping and ma making sure that i'm prioritizing sleep as well um yeah. I'm, I've, I've always been great with that like i've, I've always <laughs> prioritized sleep I love i'm like I'm, I'm a natural born sleeper but i mean that I've, I've always really been good at time <laughs> <laughs> i've always been good at making sure that's a that's a priority so things like that and also just like I'm, I'm really lucky i live in the south side of glasgow and there's some really great parks around here and just making sure yeah. to get outside it can be really easy to be chained to your laptop um and asa is really good at making sure that dragging me out like you've not left the house today and that's something that's been really really important as well especially when the weather was so nice too but i guess you can't always count on that around here but um yeah and yeah. i imagine that must be something that's a real challenge because in the work that you do, being chained to your laptop and being always on call for people to react or create or be part of the conversation, that must be such a pull. How do you how do you work with your clients to help them understand those parameters? I mean, I guess it I guess it depends because not a lot of my clients, you know, we do a bit of planning as much as we can. So as as much as it's not the planning that we were used to working one months in advance usually we'll set topics for blogs and then i'll just go go away and do it within the time that i that i have and then um, we'll catch up later but there are some clients that i'm on slack channels with them um and i guess you kind of have to be you have to be quite reactive but just making making use of the tools within slack as well like setting yourself to away and being clear about when you're going to be working on their projects and working with other clients is just the communication is just such an important thing. But mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say that it's perfect all the time. I can't say that I'm always like today I am working on this project and I cannot respond to things because the reality is you you are offering a service and you need to be there as well. You need to be there to respond to your clients. Yes, there there are set of parameters, but. I also want to make sure that I'm there, there for them whenever they need me as well. And the thing is, is that if you're working with good people, they'll get it. They'll be like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to phone her at like, you know, 10 o'clock when she'll be in bed, obviously. If she's like, oh, <laughs> you're up at six, remember, for your... Every nice. day, not just once a week, not I've just once. I've got stretching to do. <laughs> I'm to stir my sleep. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, just like, I guess, working work with good people and then just communicating with them. But yeah, still remembering that I guess I offer a service to them and I'm happy. I'm happy to make sure that I'm there for them too. So, yes, yeah, just shaking that balance, I guess. Great. Now, Steph, I've, I've spoken to quite a lot of um, copywriters during COVID uh, or during this kind of period and that yeah. are kind of, you know, how, you know, they've struggled to find work, um, you know, and trying to find work. And I'm just wondering if you've got any tips for anyone in that situation, how they can best place themselves to find it. How, have you got any tips of how you do it, how you get it and how, and how you get that repeat custom? I mean, I think the... Um... I guess maybe start with any clients that you do have, try and upsell things as much as possible about extending the value of the content that you create from, for them. So if you are writing content for their website, you'd be like, have you thought of a blog for this? Or would you like me to do, um, would you like me to do some social content for you as well? Um, that can extend the value of things. Um, and I guess it's a bit, it's a clear benefit to them. The other thing is strategy can be a really good um, a good way to upsell things too because I guess you're you're really navigating what's missing and maybe what a client needs if they want to meet a certain objective and then off the back of it there's this list of content that needs to be created um, and that can be that can be a really good way to to get yourself involved and not just selling things that people don't need because yeah. people can spell that a mile off yeah. but really if people are interested. Um, then that's a that's a good way to then generate more work the other thing is maybe um create some packages some really clear packages i've seen a few freelancers do this really well recently which has been amazing to see and it's on their website the prices are there they're really transparent and really clear and just now for a lot of brands where budget is a bit of a concern they kind of want to know they're like how much is this actually going to cost me what am i getting and that's been a really good way um, that some freelancers have been getting around things because the marketing team know straight away what the deal is and there's none of this back and forth and it might not work for them. Um, so even if you have a trial 
maybe like a trial package with someone if it's like I don't know like three blog posts for a certain price then they get to see what it's like to work with you and you've got a little bit of work and if they really love it then you could potentially work with them going forward but yeah. even that trial word is just a really good way to to get people hooked and at least yeah start working with you and see what it's like so that's some of my tips <laughs> that's cool i wonder if anybody's got any questions please pop them in we've got lots of um, people joining us so please do uh, send in some some questions whilst we've got steph we can match absolutely pick our brains mm -hmm. on things yeah. Um, Steph, I wanted to ask, what is it like being a freelancer um, as a female in this environment at the moment? Because I imagine it's quite a, a male dominated profession in a lot of ways. And sometimes the content that's expected from one person to another is for, it can be often predictable. There's a lot of education that's happened really quickly for brands at the moment. People mm -hmm. like Made Brave, obviously, like these guys, you guys are all over it. Like that's your job, you know, globally focused on the strategic um, content piece um, and brand development. But actually for a lot of people, this is a new territory. Um, I just wondered what it's like being a woman in that space. I mean, I think maybe copywriting people might associate with with men quite a lot but actually content creation is there's a huge huge industry of women who are doing great work within it because if you think about it like the influencer and blogger industry and um, is there's a lot of women in in that industry and they're also turning their skills to brands as well so i guess it's um yeah, I mean, I, th I think as well, like, there's a lot of journalists. I know a lot of women women journalists who the media industry just now is kind of shattering into pieces. So they're moving into branded content now as well. So there's actually a lot more women than maybe people originally think. So it's, it's great. Like, I love to see, I mean, I follow... I follow a lot of women on Twitter and follow a lot of women on LinkedIn and everything as well. Um, so I see, I don't know, I guess, it's, I guess it depends on who on who you follow, like and in, in looking, seeking out for these people as well. Yeah. So for me, um, it's fine. I, I, I don't really think I've, I've had a massive amount of issues. Any, I think any issues that do happen always happen behind closed doors. So you Absolutely. never really know if, if anything is actually happening, if you've been discriminated against because it happens in places where you will never be present um, yeah. but i mean as far as as far as things go face to face thing you know i've never really had any issue with it to be honest which but, is great yeah. to hear and and I, the reason i asked the question is just especially over the last few months and as andrew mentioned you know it, through creative entrepreneurs called being available for support and for chat and for people to yeah. understand um where the roots are for employment and where the roots are for opportunity and i've just spent lots of time with some brilliantly talented women who have just lacked some confidence who are just now doing this for the first time out mm -hmm. on their own as freelancers and not sure where to go or what to what to engage with and and just you know trying to get them to kind of walk through the door and say it's fine just yeah. go for it yeah i mean i've seen a few programs where i forget who it was i wonder if it was there was a whiskey company and they, they put out a campaign for women coming back into advertising after having kids. And obviously that's a massive, massive challenge for a lot of women. My, my sister just had two kids and um, she's going to be starting uni again. And I think she feels a little bit nervous about walking into a room and just like being in a new profession again. And I think that, you know, it's it can be, it can be a real challenge for women and it starts to become an issue whenever maybe a woman gets to a certain age bracket and everyone's, you know, again, behind closed doors might be like, oh, no, you don't want to work with her because she will likely be having children and everyone makes a lot of assumptions um, yeah. off the back of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why a lot of women end up losing confidence um, because maybe they think that it's something that's, that's to do with them when actually it's not, it's just biases. Mm -hmm. Um, this can turn into a really long conversation. You know. <laughs> yeah, we should that do we'll this talk about wine it. or something the next time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, Heather's got a great question, I think. Uh, Keenan, is that Heather picking up a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so she's saying, hey, Steph, uh, I'd love to know about a standout project you've done that you've oh, really cool. loved since going um, freelance. Nice question, Heather. Um, to be honest, there's one just now which I'm doing, which I absolutely love. It's called, it's a newsletter um, called Adultish. Um, sometimes people pronounce it adultish. And it's, uh, um, it's for a company called Nude Finance. Essentially, they're like a financial friend for first time buyers, they're based in Scotland as well. And um, they've got an app and it helps people save for the deposit and everything and change their spending. But anyway, they have a newsletter 
they have a newsletter which is essentially about getting your life together and um, so it ties in really nicely with the with the nude yeah. audience um and we do interviews every single week with people and like bring together cool links that might be useful on things like you know like how to fix um, a radiator or things like how to be indispensable at work and it's just everything about like work and careers and money and essentially what you need to become a fully fledged adult or at least feel as adult as your parents did when they were the same age as us <laughs> um, and that's been really really fun um, it's a weekly project I'm working on it with Marty Bell who's the CMO at Nude and it's just I think it's bringing together all my journalism experience and all my content experience as well and we did um, a survey recently with the readers about what they wanted to see more of or less of and that was really interesting and being able to adapt around that has been really cool mm. and I guess it's just whenever you send these newsletters out you feel like they're going out into the ether and you don't really know who reads them so to actually hear tangible feedback from people about what they wanted to see and be able to act upon it has been really fun I've loved it it's been it's been great and we've got to interview some really interesting people we had Rankin on the photographer a few weeks ago which was insane mm. it's a total chance <laughs> we just emailed him like do you fancy it and he was like yeah sure um so we had him and we've had like a forensic jeweler who was awesome um We've had um, loads of creators. We had um, also some great, um, you know, people from places like Bumble and from ASOS mm -hmm. as well. So it's been a total dream project. I've loved it. It's probably been one of my favourites so far. And it's in the middle of a pandemic and everything's been crazy. And so we're now on episode 21, I believe. So, yeah, episode 21. So that's been from like April April time. So really and it just shows you that finance up. doesn't have to be boring, right? It if you doesn't. create the content around it, it in a way that's engaging. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got tons so of questions coming in, Steph. It's You're gonna be busy. Yeah, we got tons okay. of them. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Awesome. here's another one from Marjan. Uh, what are your tips for getting into copywriting? Into copywriting. Um so I would say like I guess start with understanding brand and understand tone of voice because it will arm you mm -hmm. with, with everything you need to, to really get started. Um I would say that um there's a lot of I, I guess maybe you can find find someone who's a designer and partner up with them. This is a really old fashioned thing, a really old fashioned um state of agencies that they used to have two creatives team up together. But if you find someone who's a designer, then they'll be able to work with you um, collaboratively and you'll be able to bring a brand to life through copy and design at the same time which is really really interesting and um, other things would be I'm trying to think of any any useful any useful resources I guess just follow like follow lots of different different copywriters as well and see what they're doing and see the type of work that they're doing you'll be surprised by the amount of um, the amount of jobs that are out there as well and um, so yeah I would say Start with brand, probably team up with a designer and just follow as many great copywriters as you can. Fantastic. Cool. Um, we've got tons of them. We have so many okay. in here. Here's another from Anais. Um, hey, Stephanie, Hi. great insights and thank you. Uh, you mentioned pricing and I was wondering if you had any tips on how to get your prices down. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, um, it's something, I must admit, it's something that I'm like, constantly learning about there will always be a job that I would like damn it, I've really underpriced that and then the next time you're like okay I've learned my lesson it feels like a constant way of learning your lesson um I guess there's two there's two ways that people sometimes press and um, price work you can either go with value-based pricing which is about essentially okay I'm creating an entire brand tone of voice to you for you this is going to be massive value so this is going to have a higher price um or sometimes people use um time-based pricing so they'll set a day rate um, as well or actually I guess people just do a, pro a project price if they're working on something for a longer period of time they might have a lump sum associated to it but mm -hmm. I found that the best the best way for me was that I just I looked at what my wage was before um, an agency and just aspired to to match that and took it month month by month um, and I was able to see how much work I had to have coming in um, and really what the average cost of each project would have to be in order for me to meet that standard of what I was what I was living in and what I had to pay all my bills as well so I would say sometimes it's a case of working backwards on, on what you actually need to survive <laughs> as well. yeah yeah and just on a top tip we've got an amazing spreadsheet 
on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club site that you can put in like your mortgage, your rent, your bills, your gas, everything. And then you put in all the bits that related to your business. Like if you've got internet, website, blah, 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 all those bits. And it tells you once you've put in your work life balance, what your hourly rate needs to be to cover all of that. Mm -hmm. And then you can use that as a baseline and work your way up. So it's just for anybody that wants to use that. Now, I've got people who use that who run big, huge companies and people who are just setting out on their own. But it's a brilliant tool. You'll never need anything else because it's and it does all the formula for you. So I'll make sure that we send the link out. That's cool. Oh, there's there's actually a there's a spreadsheet. Speaking of spreadsheets, there's a spreadsheet that came out recently with um it's it's all anonymous that people across the UK have submitted their day rates and it's across copyright yeah. you can filter by um, copywriters and designers and everything. They also have location because geography obviously plays a big part into it for for your living wage. Um, I can put it in the comments afterwards, and that's been really useful, I guess, just to see what the what the average is because they also put in how many years of experience they have um and mm -hmm. that's been really cool just to see i guess where where you sit totally. where you sit in the industry and that's been really interesting and it's great to see so many people being so transparent as well even though they're anonymous it's great information that can be completely life-changing for someone from a financial perspective so i'll send it it's really good totally totally cool cool uh, should we do another one? We've got one here from Enya, which uh, is probably a good one. So she's saying, uh, hey, Steph, how would you recommend creating a portfolio of your projects? Is, the re is this really important if you're looking to go freelance? Oh, oh my God, portfolios. They, see, if you're a designer, it can be a lot easier to pull together a portfolio because everything's visual, everything looks mm. great. But whenever you're doing strategy, and whenever you're doing copy and you have to show context around copy, it can be so hard because you're like, hey, here's this document. If you want to read it for here's 20 minutes, Doc. you'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll just be constantly sending Google Docs to people. Um, so something that my friend Chris actually recommended to me was instead of getting obsessed with um, portfolios, um, he created something called a Now page. Or he got the idea from another designer. Um, and essentially it's just like a page on your website where you link to the projects that you are working on right now. Um, and it means that you have something that's out there um, without you know waiting for you to pull together the perfect portfolio because mm. we have all been, I mean, I'm there right now when it's just like my actual portfolio is hidden somewhere in a Google Drive because it's not perfect yet and I want it to be perfect. Um, and that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. Everyone's gonna be like that, but it means that you don't end up showing anything. So I would say use, try maybe this now page and just link to some of the projects that you're working on just now to get a feel for things. It is, it is important because people obviously need to see what you do, but I will say that it doesn't always have to be public. If you're just speaking yeah. directly to a client, you can have it on maybe a password protected page on your site or within a PDF, and maybe it doesn't have to be as perfect at, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, because you're you're showing it to someone and you're able to describe you're able to describe the work, um, but yeah, it can be it can certainly be a challenge if you're doing strategy or if you're doing lots of copy, um, but yeah, that's those are my tips I'd say. Cool, cool. Uh, question number thirteen. Um, <laughs> uh, what, or what, four thousand and six. Stephanie, what's your favorite? Uh, this is from Joanna. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, Thanks, what man. are your favorite tools for content creation uh, for oh, admin or creative? I found a really good one recently. A client recommended it to me, and it's called Miro or Miro M I R O, and it's basically like an on an online whiteboard tool. But it has this um, has this feature where you can create little um, like ideas maps. And again, and it's really good just for visualizing content themes and content ideas. Mm. Um, and I love it. I've become really obsessed with it because it stops me from sending yet another Google Doc to my clients <laughs> because I'm always starting Google Docs and it's just a really nice visual way. Um, and the cool thing is, is that you can have collaborators um, join your board. So it has like a post-it note function as well. So if you're doing workshops with people, especially online just now, everyone can add their own post-it notes with ideas or um, things that they like to add to tone of voice, which has been really uh, cool. Um, and it's awesome. I love it. I think it's so great. Um, another one I found recently was a um, newsletter tool called Flowdesk. 
and it's MailChimp's, MailChimp's far superior for statistics and everything and for the reports that you get but from a design perspective if you really if you want to just have a newsletter project um or if you don't need as in-depth analytics Flowdesk's design function is really great it feels a lot more it's not as hard to get something that looks nice and polished and they've got mm -hmm. lots of great templates i know mailchimp has templates but on Flowdesk they're just really pretty and it's really yeah. easy to set up and the pricing is always the same and they have a set price no matter how many subscribers that you have and that's been a really really good one so i've enjoyed that a lot that's been really fun another one is answer the public um which is a tool where you can put in a search term and essentially spits out this amazing report on yeah, all the things that people yeah. have searched for in relation to that which can mm -hmm. be again really good for figuring out um your audiences um, for content strategy mm. because you're seeing what questions people are asking instead of just guessing based on what you think people are asking and that has been so useful i've loved it and also you can download the reports as like uh, um as pngs so you can put them in your presentations as well and it looks really impressive because it's got the little guy with all the search terms around it it's great it's a really good tool so they're probably some of my three ones but that Miro one is amazing i think i sat on like a saturday night just playing around with it because I enjoyed it so much. Oh, and the Internet Archive, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Internet Archive is just this amazing resource of um, a lot of royalty free videos and um, a lot of like vintage footage as well, which is really cool. And I guess if you're if you're wanting to create content around maybe like a lifestyle and um, that can be really mm. interesting and it's and it's free. So it's great. So that's one of Marty videos. Bell's favorite sites. It probably is with Poolside. Probably uh -huh, yeah, is. That's, that's what I was thinking. It's so, it's <laughs> He's really good, good at that. <laughs> it is, yeah. But um, it's a brilliant one. I absolutely love it. So, yeah, those are, those are some of my favorites. Well, Steph, thank you so much for joining us. We have loads and loads of questions, but fortunately, we've run out of time. So I want fast. to thank everyone who joined us. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. Um, if you want to replay, watch the replay of this, we'll, of course, keep it here on LinkedIn. Also pop it on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club uk website um, and also the made brave youtube you can also catch up with all of our previous episodes we're here in this specific series with me and rachel with keenan with um with our guest each um, and we're here every two weeks on this session so please come back and join us if you've enjoyed it just turn on notifications for made brave of creative entrepreneur club and we will pop up when we are live um, if you want to find out more about Steph, you can find her here on LinkedIn. You have a website, Steph? Yep, stephaniefboyle.com. It's we just go. Stephanie F. Boyle everywhere. <laughs> um, but the last of all, it's before there. we go, if you were anyone was here at the beginning of the, the, the webinar or the, the live stream, we were wondering, we had realized that Rachel's background, her, her, her curtain is either really, really far away or really close up. And if you scroll up to the top of your comments right now, we had lots of people guessing how far um, away it was. So, Rachel, you now need to stand up and so show us, is that, is that background close up or is it virtual? Is it far away or what? Who how knows, far away is it? Who knows if this cow is close? <laughs> So it's actually quite far away. It's quite far away. It's really far away. It looks Whoa. even bigger now. Did you just shrink as well, Rachel? I'm, I'm, my mind is blown. Sorry, everyone. I've been on live streams with Rachel for weeks now, and I always thought that was like touching her back. So I'm sorry. I know. Miles away. It's, uh, it's <laughs> six, six meters high. Are you in an arena? You're in an arena. Yeah. <laughs> an arena. Anyway, thanks everyone for joining us. Stephanie, thank well, you so much. It's been a delight. So much value in that. So thank you so much. Um, thank thanks for joining us. And we'll see you all next time. Bye. 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 B